guys, Kevin Mitch here on the Big Head Pod, just sitting down, sitting here thinking about some of the whiskey that we've been been uh, privy to, being a part of the sponsor here on our show, Herman Marshall Whiskey. You guys get a chance to drink this stuff, try it out. The single malt is by far the best one they have. There's four kinds. They have a single malt, they have a blend, they have a bourbon, they have a rye. The order I would go in is a single malt by far. I just found this. Don't ever try and take this from me. I might have to beat you with the bottle. Then the rye, the blend, and then the bourbon. This stuff is phenomenal. Texas made and Texas produced here, guys. This stuff is unbelievable. So if you get a chance to do it, go grab yourself a bottle. This stuff is amazing. And welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. Today's guest is a good buddy of mine. He has been around baseball for a long, long time. And recently, Rangers fans would know him as the third base coach. And nobody better than the Mr. Tony Beasley. Bees, how are you, sir? I'm doing great, man. Uh, thanks for having me on this morning. Uh, looking forward to talking to you. Man, I appreciate you jumping on, Bees. It's us bald people got to stick together, you know? It's one of those things where I remember Stuart Scott always said, bald is beautiful. <laughs> you know it. You know it is. <laughs> it, it, it's just a nice... I don't know. It's like, I remember growing up as a kid, shaving my head just out of high school, and people yeah. were like, "What are you doing?" I just, I don't know. It just was something that just happened, and it, it just stuck. I don't, I don't get hair. I mean, you think it, look at baseball players now, bees, oh, full. Man. I mean, a wig. These things that these guys are doing. I mean, can you imagine? Did you? You bet you had hair like that growing up. I don't, yeah, but I mean, it can't be comfortable with your hat on. I mean, you got guys with. The guys got dregs, guys got like the shags, they got everything going on. So, I mean, I look at Manaya, his head, he's got the big bush. And I mean, you got to change hat sizes, you would think, like every week. If you cut your hair, you got to get a different hat. If you let it grow out, bigger hat. They drive the clevies nuts. So, <laughs> we're easy, man. Once we get a hat, it stays. <laughs> It does. Yeah, you get it, it's just those flex fits. I mean, when they get wet or something, you pull them, and then they stick up in the back, and they don't right after a clean shave. So it's, but I've seen too many hats flying off of yeah. players these days. Are you noticing that? I mean, guys throwing a pitch, throwing a cross. They just they just covering the hair. They're not fitting the head. <sighs> I, we, I think it's, this generation is just different from from when we when we were coming out, right? Bees just. No doubt. Uh, is it a fashion statement? I mean, is that what it's about? I guess. I mean, you know, everybody's got their own individuality, and everybody wants to express themselves. So, I guess you know, it becomes it comes down to that. I mean, that's why you know I even saw something the other day, but somebody even made a statement about the Yankees. You know, their policies being kind of outdated and what have you. But I respect what the Yankees do uh, because they require everyone to be groomed and. And respect the uniform and, and, and how you present yourself. You kind of like you, you have to put yourself on the back burner and put the, uh, the your baseball organization first. And so that's your job. That's, that's the organization that you work for. And so, you know, they have the right to, in my opinion, to, to set down some guidelines about how they want to be represented uh, as far as the appearance. And uh, I always respected that about the Yankees. Yeah, the, it's, they're, you're an employee, right? You should follow their their protocols that they have, and I and I get it too. But guys toe the line, right? And you talk about I think they can't have hair below the lip, so guys would grow a mutton chop, which it, we're yeah, not it, in the '70s anymore, right? Exactly. <laughs> Those old exactly. Oakland A's teams. Exactly. Yeah, but it's so. So let's go back to to Tony Beasley's playing days out of Liberty <laughs> University, baseball mm -hmm. powerhouse, kind of like Delaware where I was. <laughs> 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 you know, and that was you were drafting what? Eight was it? Eighty nine. Eighty nine. Drift. Yes. Eighty nine. Eighty nine. Yeah. And who was who drafted you? The Baltimore Orioles in the nineteenth round. Yeah, I was a senior sign, man. You know, it's like I got hurt my junior year. It hurt my ankle and uh, didn't get drafted that year. And then, so as a senior, you know, back then, like a senior sign is like maybe, maybe not you get drafted. So I wasn't really sure. I actually signed up to go to the Marine Corps. Oh, and, uh, okay. Yeah, I signed to go to officer school. And I uh, just happened to get drafted, and they allowed me out of it and gave me a chance to, to pursue that dream. So here I am 35 years later still still doing it. So 
just a blessing, just a blessing. So you think you did make the right decision at that time? I think so, yeah. I mean, I, I you know what? I think that, you know, in life, like, you don't know, like, at a young age, what's right, what's wrong, like, what path you're going to take. But I think that, you know, sometimes we, I always walk by faith and just try to trust God to, to put me where he needs me. And and uh, I think that things always work out when you do it that way. But at the same time, you know, from a biblical standpoint, says everything that we do, we should do to God's glory. And so no matter what, no matter what, area of life win i think if as long as we're putting god first and trying to serve him in it then it works out because it's for his glory so yeah you're right because it's the the lives that you've changed either through baseball or it could have been through the military or yeah you know, like you said you, you never know what what exactly. you're going to do it's the path that, that you go down so you're 20 what 22 at the time yeah, 21 yeah, 22 20 21 i think 21 21 Okay, so That's you're December birthday. Oh, okay, so you're so you're a late a late one there. Yeah. So that so that decision you go to and at that as people that are listening when you're drafted as a senior basically it's like a bucket of balls at that point right because they don't have to really offer you anything. No, it's just you want to play or not. Basically, that's just just you know how it was, and uh, so I wanted to play and uh, just took a shot at it and uh, just felt like you know that. I could make the most out of it, and I did. So I'm just just grateful that I, you know, was I had the opportunity to do it, and uh, it's worked out. You know, it's worked out. It hadn't been an easy ride, I can tell you that. You know, um, just been a grind through the minor leagues, and you know, nine minor league seasons, and you know, didn't play in the big leagues up to AAA. I played, and then uh, transitioned into coaching, and. Just the grind of that, because go back to the bottom of the barrel and start all over again, and then you know eventually was fortunate enough to work my way to the top. Uh, you know that's kind of not the route that that people take anymore, but um, I'm thankful that I that I had to do it that way. So that conversation you said you you know your last year playing triple A ball is mm -hmm. was it did a coach or somebody just come to you and say hey Tony you know this is the you know the writing's on the wall do you want to get into this or is it just a decision of saying hey I see it this is what I want to do yeah well it was more I think in my situation it was more me uh, Cam Bonifay was the general manager at the time and so he um he had told me that whenever I was done playing that. You know, there was a coaching opportunity for me if I wanted it. And, uh, but, you know, but he said, but play as long as you want to play. And, uh, and I, I got to the point where I was married, I had a kid, and I, free agency was just starting to be a thing where you bounce around. I didn't want to bounce around. Um, I, I had made money, I wasn't stable, and I just, I just wanted some stability. And, uh, I felt like at that point, coaching was, a little bit more stable than playing and so i just i went into it uh didn't really know what to expect out of it i uh, just know i still love the game and I, and I wanted to be a part and so i was a player coach in 97 98 and uh because i wanted to see it and so they gave me the chance to to see both sides of it uh to to be an active player but at the same time be involved in the coaching side of it as well which is kind of rare and unique they don't do that much anymore either uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, I, I felt like, yeah, this is something I would enjoy doing. And uh, and after the 98 season, I was full-fledged coach. You know, some guys, when they're done playing, they, they, it seems as if they're chasing something that they never got to, right? It seems like they're they're – they're trying to fulfill something but it doesn't seem like that's what you were trying to do it just it, like you talked about it felt like this is where i wanted to go you know guys hang on to hang on you weren't hanging on to hang on you were hanging on because you love the game correct exactly i mean i didn't you know what i always felt like you know whatever i do i'm gonna i'm gonna do it to my best and uh and you know whatever comes out of it comes out of it. I uh, felt like as long as you leave it all out on the field, we tell players that all the time, like <clears throat> leave, it, <clears throat> excuse me, leave it all out there, and then accept the results. And so I, you know, I I looked at my career that way. You know, just leave it all out there and uh, and let the chips fall where they may. And uh, it's like I said, I felt like God was always in control, and so I never like wondered like well, why this or why not, why me or why not me. None of that stuff was just, I'm just going to take every day and enjoy the day and, and give my best today and, 
we'll deal with tomorrow when and if it gets there. And uh, that's kind of how I did it. But I, I know that my love and passion for the game uh, was not to be questioned. And um, I wanted to be a part of it. Uh, I felt like, you know, when when I decided to do something with my life, I wanted, to be a, I wanted it to be a career and not just, you know, something that was a flash in the pan. Of, you know, of helping of helping others and doing that. So yeah. as you go through your coaching, the, pro, the progressions and stuff, coordin, were you a coordinator, um, infield guy, um, and everything? So what, you know, doing all that, what, what se- seemed to be your little niche that you liked the most? Was it the coordinating part of it or the stable, consistent coaching part where you in, in one spot? Well, you know, it's weird because I, I started out as a hitting coach, and uh, I absolutely loved it. And, um, you know, even in, I think it was, I think it was like 2000, maybe, or it was either 99 or 2000, I had to go to Lynchburg just because J.J. Davis was there. And he was our number one prospect. And, um, and I was a, like a second year hitting coach, second year coach, and they put me in charge of him to get him right. And uh, it was a process, man. So it was the first time I really got, had like a, like a like a job specific task, like get this guy right. This is our number one pick, and uh, and the first half was slow, and then the second half he took off, and uh, all the work that we put in paid off. So it was that was gratifying. But you know, I just felt like the passion that that you have to do the job, like the hitting coach thing, man. I just loved. I love to see the kids grow from start from scratch and then finish stronger at the end and make adjustments uh, in season. Uh, so the hitting coach thing lasted for about three years, <clears throat> maybe four years. Then um, Willie Stardew was with the Pirates then, and um, and he was like, "Bees, you got to manage." And I was like, "I don't really want to manage. And I, I like what I'm doing." <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, "No, he said, trust me, you, you'd be good at managing." And uh, he said, "You have a way with people, and uh, and and the kids respect you, so you you should manage." And so I, I wasn't going to manage. And then Dave Lord McClendon got the big league job. Dave Clark was the um, short season A manager and Lloyd wanted Dave on the staff. And so he took Dave Clark to the big leagues. And so Williamsport uh, job came open and I was told because I think Willie probably <laughs> talked to Cam and uh, he said, Beast, you're going to manage short season. And so I stayed and extended. And that was like my managerial trial to get some experience at it. And uh, I fell in love with it. I uh, didn't know that it was something I'd want to do, but, you know, it was a different level of impact on the on the guys. And it was not just hitters. It was the totality of the game, uh, on and off the field, everything. And uh, so I fell in love with that part of it and just building those right relationships with the, with, all, with all these young kids and, and trying to grow them into men and, and to show them, you know, that that this is a life that, that you've chosen that, it can be rewarding, uh, but it's not about all about making it to the big leagues and because that's everybody's goal. But I told them everybody's not going to make it. It's a small percentage that makes it, but everybody can be productive in life. Everybody can make an impact in life. And uh, that was always my message to them. And so I guess I kind of took on a father figure to the kids. And that's just the way I, I enjoyed doing that, man. And so we had success. We won. But at the same time, I felt like, you know, we were winning in life as well. So I, I love being a manager, man. Uh, and uh, that that was that was what kind of really propelled me into everything that came after that. You know, I, I was a manager until I had an opportunity to, in 2006, to be Frank Robinson's um, third base coach with the Nationals. And then the coordinating came after that, you know. And stuff like that. So I've, I've worn many different hats in the game. Uh, I'm thankful for, uh, that I've seen a lot of areas of the game. So, um, you know, it, it makes you versatile and flexible. So, you know, it's benefited me in the long run. It seems like the impact that you talk about, especially on those, the kids coming out of, you know, the Arizona, the Fire League or the Gulf Roast. These kids are, yeah. some of them, these Latin kids, some of them are 17, 18 years old, young kids, high school yeah. kids. So the, the impact that you have at that point, right there they really don't have the attitude you know there's today's the attitude so you're able to really start from scratch as 
as a young as a young man being able to teach these guys look guys and it's amazing though the the impact that you can have on them i mean it's the guys yeah. so is there you know with those young guys is there anybody that really stands out from that core group of that first few years of managing that really stands out in your mind man i had jose batista when he was this young kid and um and jose loved the game and man i tell you what he was a fireball like he was so temperamental, it was unbelievable. Like he's very talented, but he could not accept failure. Like he was a perfectionist, uh, very intelligent guy. But man, he he'd be like four for five, and he made it out, which was a line out, and and he was like so irate about that. You know, he could not accept not being perfect every night, and so you know, just trying to teach him how to be a good teammate, and you know that you're four for five with the line out and. The guy next to you, he's 0 for 5 with maybe three strikeouts. Like, he don't really want to hear you whining about lining out. <laughs> you know, so stuff like that. And, you know, just trying to let them understand that, you know, being a good teammate is important. And uh, and you have to look beyond yourself and, and, and recognize that the guy next to you, like, he's he's in the battle with you. And that you got to be cognizant of, 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 of who's in that clubhouse uh, each and every day. So he was, he was one guy that, you know, I felt like, um, I had an impact on, uh, helped him to grow up a little bit, and and turned him, uh, try to turn you know boys to men, and so he 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 became a man, and uh, you know he's he's always reached out and and thanked me for that, and and uh, you know we still remain close to this day. You know we we actually talked last this off season. He he wanted me to come and and uh, manage uh, in Winter Bowl uh, with the team that he uh, is connected with, and so things of that nature, but. There are many other guys that didn't make it to the big leagues. Uh, you know, Brandon Agamononi, uh, he still reaches out to me. Uh, he 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 reached out, and it was maybe three or four years ago, and he said, uh, you know, thank you for teaching me um, that, you know, that can be godly men in the game. And uh, he said, I, because of my experience with you, he said, God, you know, I went into the ministry. Like, I'm a pastor now. And, you know, so they're doing – different things in life, but, you know, both guys were very successful and, and productive in their lives. And, and that's, that's what makes it all worthwhile. It, yeah. The impact that that has of, of somebody coming to you after, even though they never made it as yes. on the baseball side, they made it on in, in life itself because of the, like you yeah. said, the impact that you had. I mean, yeah. you, you never thought about that going into coaching. I'm going to, I'm going to change lives. Somebody, these guys are going to be X, Y, Z, yeah. as opposed to, I'm just going to take this one day at a time That's and right. you see the fruits of your labor. But I think, it, that must be the most rewarding part is when somebody can call and say, Hey, bees, thanks for everything you did, regardless mm -hmm. of the baseball side. And I mean, how does that make you feel so, as far as just as a coach and just as a person in general? Yeah, that's, that's way more rewarding than the guy that was super, super talented that, you know, you know, he was going to make it regardless. And, uh, it's, it's the, it's the guys that man were the grinders and the guys that were organizational guys and that, you know, you made them feel like they were special and, and they were a huge part of, of the team and you impacted their lives and, and they were successful in other areas. I mean, those those are the guys, man, that, that made it all worthwhile. I mean, there's a ton of guys that played in the big leagues. Ryan Doman, you know, uh, Chris, Chris Duffy, those guys, they still reach out as well. They all reach out. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for all that. You know, but it's, it's guys that didn't make it that reach out as well. And so I think that's the greater impact. And uh, because it, this this game is tough, man, it's tough. And uh, the numbers are, are against you, you know, mm -hmm. from day one. And so, you know, it's important that we create value in, in people. And, uh, and something Jeff Bannister used to say that I didn't forget, like we value people over products and, you know, we don't, don't treat them like pieces. You know, everybody's a human. And uh, yeah, that meant a lot to me, and I try to try to keep that alive. And that's that, that's it. That's the relationships that you build, especially with the players, because yeah. players, especially the younger ones, can see the forest through the trees yeah. of knowing. Coach B is in this more for the, than just what's on the surface. There's more there, right? So, and you're able to develop that at a younger age with these guys, and and that's what helps uh, help propel you right from. A, from short season A manager to a big league coach because of yep. the relationship you have. The guys respect you, which means they're talking, which means somebody else is hearing. Other coaches are hearing, hey, 
Beasley would be a great guy for this job. Like, let's, yeah. And that's what it is. And that's, so that's where it's carried you, but, and you never thought it would have taken you where it has. Mm-mm. Yeah. I mean, I never had, you, to be honest with you, like after not playing in the major leagues, I never, I never anticipated that I would coach in the major leagues. I was, I was just, I was pretty much content with like, you know what, I'm going to be a minor league coach and I'm going to impact, you know, people's lives and I'm going to you know get the most out of these kids and I'm going to develop major league players. I'm going to develop, you know, great human beings and that's my calling. And uh, I was, I was very content with that, you know, because the way that you used to get a major league coaching job was you had to be connected with someone back in the day. And uh, I didn't, I wasn't connected with, you know, major league managers or none of that. And, uh, and to end up on Frank Robinson's staff was like, that's a godsend because like, I knew no one understand. I knew who Frank was, obviously, but I didn't have a relationship with him. You know, I didn't know David Lopes. I knew who he was. Didn't know him personally. You know, and um, Jim Bowden interviewed me. I didn't. I didn't know who Jim Bowden was. You know, he didn't, he didn't know who I was. And uh, he he just happened to tell me that he was. I was uh, like uh, my league coach of the year, manager of the year. And he said I was just happened to be the Yankees had. And I hired me as an infield coordinator. I, yeah, before that, I'll take that back because they had, they had hired me as an infield coordinator. And I don't know if it sparked interest or what, but he said, he said, like, you don't know me and I don't know you and you're wondering why you're here today and how did you get a chance to this interview? And I said, yeah, I kind of am. And he said that, uh, you know, I, I saw that, you know, the Yankees had interest in you. And then I saw the fact that, uh, you minor league manager of the year. So I just kind of started digging and seeing if I could find something negative. And he said, I couldn't find anything negative. Your team had, all, had always won every year. He said, and I called around. I just wanted to hear one bad thing. And I said, I couldn't find it. So he said, so I said, this guy deserves an interview. And because of that, he gave me an interview based on my reputation. And he hired me, you know, the next day to be the third base coach. Like he, Jim Bowden, in my mind, took a shot with me and he, he gave me an opportunity and it kind of propelled my career, career into, um, you know, gave me opportunities that I have that led up to where I am today. So, you know, I'm, I'm thankful to, to Jim Bowden for that. I really am. And I don't know if people understand what minor league coaching is like, because you know, once the season ends, it's not as if you're going to, if you, unless you have something else, it's season ends, you're done, right? You go home and then just wait to see if I'm going to get a call again. So yeah. it's almost is, uh, you know, it's almost, uh, you're hoping for something, right? The, the feeling of, I guess it's the uncertainty of a minor league coach, because if you're hoping that if you do well, you're, you get to move up, right? It all depends on, because there's a lot of turnover. So, yeah. I mean, now you have this, and all of a sudden, it, you've got a, 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 a general manager calling you saying, hey, Tony, we'd like to talk to you about what, you know, almost, it's like a principal calling you into the office. Hey, uh, yeah. what did I do wrong? As opposed to no, <laughs> right? You get that, is that yeah. the feeling you, that you get as a coach going through yeah. that process? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for anyone that doesn't know, it is the absolute grind. There's no, there's no security or longevity in it. I mean, it's, it's, it pretty much is year to year. We work from, we work on one year contracts. Uh, you know, when, when after you've spent some time in it, you're lucky enough to maybe sometimes get a, a two year deal, and once in a while there's a three year deal, but that's very rare. Uh, and so, you know, there's not a lot of like stability as far as. Like, I know that I'm going to be doing this for the next 20 years or 30 years, and I'm going to retire. You don't know that. And so, but I remembered one thing, you know, my father used to tell me, like, like always just be good at your job. He said, be good at what you do. He said, and you'll always have a job. So he said, don't worry about stuff. And so I just focus on trying to be good at whatever I'm doing and uh, and uh, not, not worry about where I'm going or what the next step is. Just be good today, you know, and uh, earn it, earn yourself a chance to put the union on, you know, one more day and just keep doing that day in and day out, day in and day out. And, you know, before you know it, man, for me, you know, 35 years have passed, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. you know, still still putting the uniform on and uh, I'm just grateful and thankful. But it is a grind. And so the way you carry yourself and the way you treat people 
and just just the way that you you know just give of yourself and your time and invest in others so it, it comes back to you whether it's good so, or bad it's coming back to you so is your is your father always instilled that in you from a from a faith perspective of understanding yes you know we, you can't worry about tomorrow we tell the kids all the time you know tomorrow's already taken care of you have enough problems today so that's and that is has that always been instilled in you from the time you were a kid or is that just something that, that you just came within you know while you were playing baseball you know my dad he kind of instilled that in us um as, as a kid um yeah my dad was a lumberjack man and uh we 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 i still do that in the off season with my brothers uh so he worked hard but you know my father you know he was a he was a godly man and um you know he loved the lord uh he made us go to church you know some people say make me go <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, but he made us go to church. He, you know, there was principles, and everything was in, was uh, revolved around your faith. And like he was like, if you if you don't if you don't go to church today, like you can't go out and play. You can't do nothing. Like unless you're sick, you go to church. You know, and I it, baseball like back in the day playing. We didn't have travel ball then, but we had rec, rec ball and stuff and games on Sundays. He said you go to church first, and then you go play baseball and. He's like, if you skip church to go play baseball, you're not going to be blessed. He'd always instill that, <laughs> you know. So everything was God first, God first, God first, God first, and I. That's just the, that just stuck with me, and uh, I don't want anything to to get in front of God. No, no matter what it is, I don't want anything to get in front of God, and uh, and I, and I think that that's. That's what's helped me throughout my life and, and my career and everything that I've done and, and been through and experienced because it's God first. You know, even mm -hmm. I dealt with cancer, it was God first, and uh, that's how I got through it. And uh, so I'm just grateful and thankful, you know, that my father and my mother, they instilled those values in me. And uh, I don't ever want to forget that. I try to instill that in my son as well. You know, put God in front of everything, man. And you, and you and we talk you're talking about that and um, that's that was gonna be my next topic was um the the was it rectal cancer correct that yes you were yes. diagnosed with how you know like just that the leading up to it finding out and mm -hmm. during i don't know if it's during the season and and that time off leading up to it what what kind of precipitated this the process of you finding out about all this yeah man i i didn't i didn't have a clue like what was going on with my body i um I'd never like had hemorrhoids before in my life. And then in 2015, which was my first year here with the Rangers, uh, like mid season, you know, I started developing hemorrhoids and it's like, what's going on with that? I didn't know what it was. So I talked to Dr. Hunter and he checked, he said, hey, you have some hemorrhoids, had multiple hemorrhoids and, uh, and they were bleeding hemorrhoids. And so, you know, Steve Bouchel had dealt with it, so he knew what it was all about. And he was like, oh, there's a pain in the butt. I said, but, you know, there's Literally, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> literally. <laughs> and, uh, and so Dr. Hunter told me that, you know, they would they would ease and go away. And if not, then he felt like I probably had some internal internal polyps and we could go in and, and move those, remove those if, if need be. And so the off season came and they never subsided. And uh, it was, you know, I was, I was starting to feel like a, like a sharp pain going down my, my right leg. It's like a nerve. So I was seeing the chiropractic and the stretch. I was doing other stuff. It's like something's just not right. And uh, I was having a little blood in the stool. I didn't pay much attention to that. And because I have no family history of cancer. So, you know, I kind of ignored some signs. I really did. And just nothing got better. And then my wife's like, you, you need to get, uh, get checked because something's not right. And so when we finally got a colonoscopy. And, uh, and when we got that, I was 49 at the time. So I was like one year you know, away from getting one anyhow. And so we got the colonoscopy. They found a tumor in my rectum. And it was very low. And so the doctor said immediately that, from his experience that he knew it was cancer. So I did, did the biopsy and everything, and it did come back uh, that it was cancer. And uh, so at that point, it was like, let's beat it. That was my whole thing, man. Like, let's beat it. And um, I just I just trusted God through that process. And uh, it was 2016 was, it was January of 2016 was when I 
found out. And that whole year was, you know, chemotherapy and radiation and uh, ostomy bag, you know, temporarily. Uh, and so it was just, it was a different year. It was a, it was a year in which I would never anticipated experiencing in my life. Uh, but man, it was a year that I, I learned so much about myself, so much about others and so much about who God is. And, uh, I could truly tell you that's probably the best year of my life. And uh, it probably doesn't sound right, but, you know, because I could have never learned, I could have never known God the way I know him now if mm -hmm. I hadn't experienced uh, going through cancer. Uh, my doctor told me last year, after six years of, of getting, uh, you know, treatments and six, I mean, after six years of getting scans and updates and checkups, you know, last year I was I was clean and clear, and that was the last checkup. And so after that last checkup, he told me that I was right at stage four cancer. I did not know that. Didn't know. I was thinking I was maybe stage two or so. And uh, and he said you were absolute miracle. Uh, the tumor that was in my rectum um, was very low, and the the reconnection process. If the tumor is low, it's almost impossible to reconnect the person. And so, because your bowel movements just won't function. And so they have to put an ostomy bag permanently. Mm -hmm. And I was I was telling my doctor, I, I won't wear an ostomy bag permanently. I said, my body's going to function the way God designed me to function. Like, nothing clean is going to dwell in my body. Like, cancer is not mine. Like if someone said your cancer, I would correct that right away. So it's not my cancer. It's something that's in my body, doesn't belong in my body. Nothing then clean is going to dwell on me. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And uh, that was my response to that. Doctors, I think, kind of thought I was crazy because I'd never accepted anything that they said to me about symptoms or, you know, after treatment, you're going to experience this. It's going to be coldness of touch, numbness. You're going to lose your appetite, lose weight, you're going to be tired, you're going to vomit, you're going to everything. I did none of those things. I had no symptoms whatsoever. Uh, my platelets never went down. My, my my red and white blood counts stayed consistent. The doctors were amazed every time. and uh, But I was just covering myself with the blood of Jesus and trusting God that that he had healed me. Okay, I went, to, I went for the surgery to remove the tumor. And so before that surgery, we did scans on a Friday. The, the surgery was scheduled for Monday. And after we did scans at MD Anderson, and uh, the tumor Friday was still there. The doctor was disappointed. Was the, the radiation hadn't done anything. The chemo hadn't done anything to the tumor, nothing. It was just pretty much the same as it was from the beginning. And so he was very concerned that he could not perform the surgery. And I said, you will. I said, you will. I said, and maybe you won't. I said, but you'll be used. I said, you'll, it'll be fine. Don't worry. And he said that I just can't promise you that I can do what you want me to do. I said, it'll be done. I didn't, I didn't doubt it. I never doubted, not once. And uh, I went, my wife and I went to the hotel that evening. And because uh, we, Saturday and Sunday, we just, which is a waiting period. And I prayed. And we, we prayed and I said, Lord, I've done everything medically that's been uh, required of me, you know, all the radiation and chemo. And I said, but I claim the healing back in April. I said, I'm standing on that healing. I said, I, I believe that, that you do everything that you said. And I haven't doubted, I haven't wavered. I've just trusted and believed in you. And I know that you've healed my body. I can feel it. I just know it in the name of Jesus. I said, Monday morning, when the doctors get into my body, you're going to receive glory. I just know it. It's your time to show up and show out. I said, and no one can receive the glory but you. And I said, in Jesus' name, amen. And Monday morning, I went in there. I had a ro robotic pectonomy was this type of surgery I had. And the doctors, uh, he got inside and got everything positioned. And he came out, came out and told my wife after three hours that there was no tumor there. After Friday seeing it, now he, he couldn't explain that. He said it was just scar tissue, and he cleaned it up, and my margins were clean, and he said he's going to be good. And so that's God. And can't nobody tell me anything different because 
the tumor was there Friday. We looked at it. We saw it. The doctor was discouraged by it. And then Monday morning, it was just scar tissue. So it's I know, it's I, amazing I, how like you you talked about being able to to not having worry right not having to because of understanding yeah. unless you've been through that muck right people don't know and like you said a minute ago that year was the best year of your life and people go how well, how can he say something like that because they don't know jesus and what the power is and people can question that but you know you say because maybe it gave you an opportunity to step away from baseball that you've been tied up in for what 15 years at the time 20 years at coaching where you were able to get kind of get back on track maybe maybe that's why it was right we, we don't know why things happen right. correct we just we just trust and know that it's just part of the process mm-hmm. but seeing that and, and hearing that from you that's that seems like it was just kind of where Maybe you were off track a little bit, and it was one of those, hey, bees, this is what's going to bring you back on track. And, but that, and that's why, you, like you said, you look at it as, hey, this was a great year for me, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's, it's a mate, your story, what it, what it can do for one person, right? We, I always tell the kids, I tell people all the time, if I change one person's life, I've done my job. You've done it, yeah. Right? That's right. Yeah. So, and it, I don't... And I don't, I don't know that I was off track, but I, I think with me, it's I was asking. I think sometimes we got to be careful what we ask for because you mess around and get it. But I was asking God, I was praying the prayer of Jabez that God would increase my territory, like enlarge my platform, and let me do more for Him. And uh, and maybe that was the way it, it manifested itself because you know I was, I was, I considered myself faithful, and uh, you know I wasn't. I wasn't living a messed up life or just doing weird stuff. Just that's why when when I was diagnosed, people were like even David Lopes called me, and David Lopes like like if that can happen to you, it can happen to anybody. Like that, you have no. And I and I was I was I was immediately like, why not me? Like none of us are exempt from hardship or or illness or nothing. Like we don't know. I just think that you know, you know, I want I wanted to do more for the Lord. And uh, he allowed me to go through something that gave me a, a, a bigger platform for him uh, because I've been able to to help people that are dealing with cancer and and I've been able to touch lives that I that I didn't have an avenue to touch before. And so and, and I've been able to know God more intimately uh, as well, because just actually, you know, when you hear about healing, it sounds great, but like. You don't really know, like, like I always hear about, it's like, do I really believe like healing like that? Because, but, in, but when you actually deal with it, and then you know, like, God showed Himself to me, and uh, He He did a, a miracle. He did a work in my body that only He could have done, and so it just made me just love Him that much more and be that more on fire to. To, to serve him and, and to let people know who he is and what he's all about. You know, my, my favorite verse in the Bible, and I used to tell people, Second Corinthians 5 and 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. And I said that before cancer, but I had to actually live that out. And so, you know, you know we say things all the time, but then God say, okay, that's your favorite verse. Let's see. <laughs> Let's see. You know, and so, you know, just understanding that through faith, man, all things are possible and that God can do anything if we believe and we don't doubt and we don't waver because he says a man that doubts and wavers, you know, he can't believe that man shouldn't think that he can receive anything from the Lord. And so I think it was just solidifying, you know, my faith and, 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 and believing and the trust and knowing who God truly is. And uh, he showed himself to me, man. I mean, he took a tumor away from my body, you know, from a fr- from Friday to, to, to Monday. It was gone. And that's nobody but God. And I know that, that through that whole experience, you know, I I was so in tune with his word that I'd wake up in the middle of the night sometimes, just just raise my hands up and say, thank you, Lord, for healing me. And this is like in June and July, just... 
never losing sleep and nothing. Just I just knew I was going to be good. I don't I don't know how I had peace through that, but I just had peace because I just trusted God through the whole process. But you know, I, I guess it was one of those times in my life was like maybe the enemy came to him and say, "What about can I mess with him like he did with Job?" Mm -hmm. You know, he'll, he'll he'll denounce you if we touch his body or we do something. I don't I don't know. Maybe yeah. when I get to heaven, I can ask God about that. Yeah, you know, maybe yeah. He could give me some insight. But I'm I'm just thankful that that I was able to be faithful uh, through a tough time because it's easy to give God glory when everything is great. But can we give him glory, you know, when we're on the backside, when the, on the, on the, in the valleys of life and, and through the tough times of life, can we still praise him and, and, and be faithful to him? Uh, it's, it's easy when things are going great, but what about when things are not going so great in your life? Can you still you know, give God glory. And so I'm thankful that I was able to to keep him first, even through the midst of hardship. To weather in that storm. And I guess I, I guess off track was maybe a, a bad term, but, you you, you know, it's just a, I guess literally you had a bump in the road, right, for yeah. you. Yes. Uh, you know, it, it's one of those things <clears throat> of talking about, you know, what you live by, you know, yes. I live, you know, two Bible verses I love, I live by Proverbs 3, 5, you know, mm -hmm. trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And, and, um, Psalm 40 verse two, he lifted me out of the pit of destruction and placed my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. And, you know, you talked about, uh, Job. I always, I always tell people when things go, you know, why is it, why aren't things happening? You know, why is it not? I said, look at Joshua in the battle of Jericho. Right, you hear yeah. that story about what do yeah. they do? They just keep just keep walking. Keep really, walking. keep circling those walls. Right? <laughs> really, what, what's going to happen? And that's and that's what it is. Until you've been through that muck, you know what it's like when you know people. You know, he said Beasley's. Been, hey, I, right? We've all had yeah. that. But that believers understand they've had their moments where something bad has has really happened, and it's it's yes. weathering that storm because it's. I remember uh, Pastor telling me he said. It's not going to be easier, but it will be better. Right. And I thought about that for a second. I went, that makes sense. Yeah. I, you know what? I, it's <laughs> right. Because there's times when you want to yell and, and just, just be like, ah, why is this? And you realize, and when you do that, all of a sudden, you sometimes the answers come to you and you go, I understand. I get it. I got it. Yeah. Right. So, you, so that was your moment where you had it and understanding, but it's, um, but how people can see it, and you did it with a smile on your face. I remember that year you were gone of, of yeah. you know, you know, where's Bees? How's he doing? Right, yeah. and all this. So were you really, during that time, were you in touch with baseball at all? Or is it just a complete step back for a year? No, I was, I was, I was still with the team. I just, you know, I wasn't coaching third, but I was, you know, the doctor, because I had the, um, the port in here for my mm -hmm. treatments. But the doctor, would, he didn't want me to, Stand because I would have actually stood out there and I would, you know, spike spike coach third that year, uh, spike Owen. But I, um, I, I, I felt like I was, I didn't want to like succumb to cancer. Like, I was like, I'm gonna keep doing my stuff. Like, I was still going to practice, I was still hitting ground balls. Like, when I was having treatment, I used, I used to have to wear the uh, the treatment, the, the, the drip for 48 hours, yeah. And so I'm, I think my, my batter's getting, trying to get a little here. And I um, and I was still doing it. They were like, what are you doing out here? It's like, well, I, I wanted to maintain a normal my normal lifestyle. And uh, I, I wasn't going to lay down and be like, oh, I'm down and out. I wouldn't do that. The Bible says that the inhabitants should, should, not, should not say I'm sick. Don't say it. And uh, I never said it. I just, I did what I could do. You know, I just... I had treatments and stuff like that, and I just respected that process. But I wasn't, uh, I wasn't going to lay down and to come to it. And it's and uh, the amazing, like I said, the the story that you can tell people of of asking about how right because you know it, it, we're seeing a lot more and more cancer you know coming yeah. up with people and stuff and and the story that you tell you know when somebody comes up to you and they just say hey hey tony how did you how did you handle this right. and you tell them you start talking about jesus and god and so it's a hard pill for some people to swallow it is so so when when it is when it is that hard pill for them to swallow how do you navigate that i just tell my story man and uh I don't 
navigate it. I just tell it. And um, because if someone asks, then I have to tell the truth. And uh, the truth is that, you know, everything that happened to me was God. It wasn't nothing that I've done of my own. It's not that I'm deserving. Well, it's his grace and his mercy. And I'm thankful that, you know, I've tried to live a life that's, that pleases him and that he find favor and he found favor in me, man. And that the blood of Jesus healed my, healed my body. And, uh, I don't, I don't sugarcoat it. Um, and I don't navigate it. I just tell it. And, uh, because my story is what it is and it can only be told one way because it, it only happened one way. And, um, and I just hope that you know, people can see that and accept that. Uh, but I have to tell it. It's like the gospel. We have to tell the gospel as it is. And, and people have a choice to accept or reject Christ. And so our stories, you know, when Christ has done something in your life, you have to tell that and give him glory for that. And hopefully people can accept that. But I, I won't, I will never navigate it. Yeah. And, and here you are now. It's what, eight years now? Yeah, this seven. Is year seven. Yeah. Year seven of mm -hmm. this. And, and here you are just continuing stronger than ever of, you know, third base coach with the Rangers this year. I know mean, the last few years have been kind of a, a struggle to say yeah. the least as far as, uh, you know, on the field, um, you know, with, but bringing in Boach, an old school guy, you're an old school guy. Yeah. Um, you know, mad dogs there as well. Another old school guy. You, right. Hopefully you can kind of flip this script to get back to baseball and, when we were playing it, right? Yeah, that's the, right. The, I, I'm, I'm the, believing in that. I'm yeah, and that, and that's what you want. That's what the fans the, the fans want us. They want to see the, the old school of the small ball stuff, and, and you see, and, and and you know the the rules and how they've changed. And I don't. It, it's tough, right? For it's sometimes it's still hard to watch. Yeah. You know, and I'm sure it was for you for a while watching out there how the game was going. Um, and seeing that, but your understanding of, like you said, there's there's light at the end of the tunnel yep. of seeing it, right? It's just about having that faith of understanding that it's there, guys. We've just got to – so, I mean, so there's – you know, last, so last year, I just real quick, the, your, the managing part of it. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you got those, the last, what was it, 40 or 50 games? Yeah, so, 40, that what, 48, yeah, 48 games. Did that change the juices, the 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 adrenaline back to Tony Beasley, minor league manager? Did you mm -hmm. have that, or was it just I'm still just a, a, the third base coach feeling mentality, or did it kind of just flip? Yeah, it, you know what? It was kind of weird. Um, I think when you take over the interim spot, like like we had 48 games left, and uh, the season was already tough, and a lot of you know, it, it had kind of been, I don't want to say it was lost, but it was, you, you got 48 games. Now that you have 148, you have 48 left. And it, it's kind of tough to, it was tough to, to find, like, how to make change with 48 games left. To, and so there were certain things I felt like we could do, but then there were certain things I felt like you just can't do in 48 days. Uh, with a team that's already kind of set and how it's how it's going to be and its personality and identity, it's, it's tough to change the identity with that little bit of time left and pretty much no hopes for the playoffs. And so, you know, I just felt like, you know, let's enjoy the, the last 48 games. Let's play hard. Let's try to, you know, finish the season with some dignity and, and keep our heads up so that we could get some momentum coming into this year. Uh, there were some things uh, internally that we wanted to do differently. Uh, it just just from a team concept, you know, and just have a good atmosphere in the clubhouse and make sure that that you create a brotherhood and that everybody's together and plan for each other. I, I didn't want the forty eight games games to be, you know, uh, gloom and doom. You know, coming in the clubhouse with a bad feeling and negative attitude and and just not feeling good about your day. And so we, we wanted to have we have, we wanted to have fun and enjoy those last forty eight games, but it was it was it was a challenge because there were certain things that that I just didn't have the freedom to do um, stepping in at that point, and uh, there were things that you were asked to do. It was like you know you didn't know if it was the the timing was right, and you know being the third base coach and now being the manager and being the interim manager and the, the prospect of you know, what's going to happen next year. So it's a fine line between compromising relationships and certain things. Uh, 
so I could, you know, this year I'm the third base coach again. So, you know, there were certain things I could have done that possibly compromised, you know, you know, my relationship with players and things uh, if I'd been too strong in certain areas. Uh, and so I feel like I would have loved to have the opportunity to have a whole spring training to, to get the team uh, with my thoughts and the way I felt like we should approach the game and play fundamentally and, and things of that nature. Uh, but, you know, Boach is here now and he's doing a great job. And um, I'm just thankful that, you know, that I'm still here with him. But uh, it was it was it was tough. It was fun. It was fun. It was it was a learning experience for me. Um, but it wasn't the same as when I managed in the minor leagues because I, I, I just didn't have uh, just the ability to start from scratch and to 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 really build the team chemistry and identity to what I would have wanted it to be. Uh, but, you know, I'm thankful for the opportunity and uh, just tried to make the most out of it. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's kind of one of those where he was fired and Hey, beast, you're managing more and you've right. You've got a short I, amount of time. It, so it, you're right though. As far as your philosophy, yeah. what, what do I have time? Do I have more time here to get these guys just to, because it, it could have been the character builder for them guys. This, yes. this is going to define, you know, how you handle yourselves, right? Right. 20 years from now, yeah. you know, the last 48 games where you were out, but this is the, maybe this is the mark that you had a chance to, to do that. And, and yeah. you won't know right away to see, right. but That's right cool. now it looks like it's been a good fit so far for, for maybe those 48 that you had last yeah. year, carrying it into this year. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I felt like that we did build some momentum. Uh, I felt like we kept the morale up and, um, you know, we kept some guys going. Some guys finished and had, had good years. I didn't want guys to waste the, the rest of their season. Uh, we wanted guys to finish strong. And a lot of guys achieved a lot of stuff. You know, Nate Lowe you know, won the Silver Slugger Award, uh, had his best offensive year so far, and, you know, and things of that nature. So, you know, Marcus finished strong. Seeger finished strong. You know, those guys played till the end, man, and they played hard till the end, you know. Uh, so, you know, our core group of players, they, they continued to post up and, and do good things for us. So I feel like I feel like it did end. It did, it, record-wise, it didn't end like we wanted it to, but it, I feel like, you know, effort and uh, things that we need to accomplish uh, as far as team unity and, and camaraderie, I, I felt like it, it, it went well. Yeah, I think it, it – yeah, we'll finish up here. I think it, it goes to – Tony Beasley as a man of weathering the storm, right? You, it, it was already a bad storm at that point. And, you, and you're given the, the keys to this thing. Here you go, Bees. And it was just, yeah. you were able just to keep it right. It, you, you, as players, you know it can go south really quick. Managers That's fired, new guys in, and everybody can just kind of go their separate ways. But it yeah. seems like you were able to weather that storm. It goes back to your faith in, in all of this and, and seeing where it, where it led. Because you, I saw the interviews with you. Like I said, you always have a smile on your face. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a fun part of what it does. And, it's, and that's a testament just to you and how you were raised and, you know, mm -hmm. and, the, and the, the, what you have, the impact you have on all these players and everything else. So I really commend you for that. Yeah. And it's like I said, that's probably one of the hardest things to do in all sports. It's just yes. to jump up. Hey, you gotta go right now. Wait, yeah. wait, what? So, and it's and I like I said, I commend you for that and 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 the effort you you did with that and what you did with it. So you know, bees. I like I said, always seeing you with that smile on your face, man. It never it never changes. It never ceases to amaze me with it. See, there it is, man. It's always there. <laughs> but you know, I, did, I one thing I didn't want to happen. Um, because I wasn't, you know, I didn't ask for that. Um, I was asked to do that. And uh, I didn't want, uh, I want, I didn't want to become a situation where it looked like I was lobbying to get the job. I still want, you know, players to come first. And I want the players to understand that, that it was, a, it's not about me. It's, it's still about you guys. And, um, you know, I'm going to back you and support you. And, you know, I want to take care of the players in the clubhouse. And, you know, I wasn't going to do things that, just for my sake and because I didn't care about that. I care about the coaches that were left there. Hopefully, you know, I want to help, you know, preserve their jobs and things of that nature. And so I felt like we did a pretty good job because most of the staff is still here as well. So grateful for that. Yes. And, and I'm sure the fans are. Like I said, you've ingrained yourself here in this community for a while now. And uh, yeah. they said the impact you have. And it'll be amazing to see how the Tony Beasley story finishes out here in the next 25, 30 years. Right. Yeah. Just to see how 
you know, like you talk about your platform and what you can do with it. So, um, you know, tell fans on there, get a chance, just go say hi to bees. Whenever you see him, he's always, always has a smile <laughs> on his face. Just yell, Hey bees. And you know, it's just, but like I said, you're having fun. You're a kid. It's, yeah. and it's always tell people you got to have a lot of little boy. You need to play this game. That's you know, right. Becoming That's a business. And yeah. you've, and you've done that. Like I said, you've instilled that in a lot of players and, and the impact you've had throughout your, your career, man. I, you know, it's like I said, it's, it's always fun. And uh, I'm glad you're able to jump on today, bees and, and, and tell this story because like I said, if one person, one person hears this and change them, right? You've done your job. Amen. Amen. So, Amen. um, Amen. And then I appreciate, like I said, jumping on here and, uh, you know, off to a good start here with the Rangers. Like I said, you guys just, just keep going. Right, one yep. day at a time, one pitch at a time. Right, that's can't right. Look, right. You can't look can't get too down far the road. Ahead. You're there. That's right. There to corral them in. Right, guys. Hey, can't get ahead of ourselves. But like I said, they're, it seems like they're having fun. Yeah, fans are enjoying it. Yeah, it's 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 really good right now. It's good atmosphere. It's fun. Uh, you know, the belief in who we are is, is strong right now. And uh, like you said, we just got to keep the you know going one day at a time and 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 bringing that energy and passion and. And, and playing the game between the lines. We, we, we know we still have to play good baseball. We can't just take anything for granted no matter what. You know, Oakland's coming into town for us now, and if you take them for granted, you get beat. They're a professional baseball team, the major league team. And uh, so, you know, you got to play the game. You, you got to play right, play hard, play smart, and be fundamentally sound and just do the right things and do what the game's asking you to do. And, uh, and we always say win means what's important now. and that's that's all it takes, and so just stay humble and, uh, and make sure that we approach today like it's our last day. Because yeah, because we never know. Because it might be. That's it the best might. advice I give my kids. You play every game like it's going to be the last one. Because one of that's these days right. it will be. That's right. Exactly right. So, man, yeah. but I appreciate bees jumping on here, man, and, and taking the time, and uh, you know, good luck the rest of the way. And I'll be out there. I'll come see you. Come, Please come do. out there. Get, come out there and give you a big old hug, man. Come yeah, see yourself man. since our relationship goes back a long, long I way. I know so. it. I know it. There. Come, come see me. Please. Yeah, I will. But I appreciate it, Bees, man. And good luck, man. And we'll, and we'll be in touch. And guys, check out Tony. Check out a Rangers game. Go out and just say hello. So, but I appreciate it, Bees. Thanks, man. Thanks, Thanks man. Thanks for having me yes, on. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Thanks, man. All right. See you.